So and let's start, I guess, with um, if anyone has any questions about either the three ayahs or any of the sorahs we've done. Okay, and then we'll go one small uh, question of clarification and one question I'll keep a little bit longer. You said that al Sarmadiyya, I think is that is that referred to in the shoot? Oh, uh, uh, sorry, I, I, I probably misspoke. In the shoot, sorry. Yeah, yeah so, the, so uh, what does Sarmadiyya specifically mean? No, Sarmadiyya is, is a word used in in <coughs> to ref, often refer to Hayat al Barzakh, uh -huh. that um, it, it even has a more specific meaning that it is between the here and now uh, in Nasud, mm -hmm. this world, and the, the world of al Barzakh. It is possible to experience um, a state of al-bayn, bayn al-baynayn, that a state of, especially if in, um, so I'll, I'll give you an example of what a, a, a muddy state would be. Uh, recently I was talking to someone who, um, his salah and zikr is such that he starts lower prayer and he becomes so engulfed in lower prayer that he, when he becomes aware, it has become out prayer. That would be a ceremony state. It's a, it's a state where you experience existence without the factor of time or sometimes space. Um, the, that same person in his ibadah, uh, he's been separated from his loved ones forever. So when in his dua, he actually experiences that he visits his family members sees them one by one, hugs them, sits with them, and then when he comes out of it, what he saw is the state they're actually in. That would be described as a Samadhi state. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a term used, and I probably misspoke and I meant it in a suit and I said a Samadhi, um, <coughs> uh, but, uh, and actually, uh, I think, um, especially Arabic, will name they use it as a name Sarmat. I've heard the name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is referring to that mm. state. Sometimes you find it also used in love poetry, uh, but it's that is more that you know uh, I love you so much that I've experienced my state as Sarmat that I am like as if I've been disconnected from the affairs of this world that you love. Which, according to Ibn Hazm, is possible. Thank you. I'll take it from him. What did Ibn Hazm say is possible? He said that it's in, in, in a state of... He, has, he divides love into types, mm. and one of his types is a, a love that takes you in a state of sorrow. Uh, but it doesn't have to do with God, it's just that you lose touch with time, place, and space, and mm. You're so in love that you don't experience the affairs of this world anymore. And the husband says that it, it often leads to madness. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Ibn the husband must, must have experienced a lot of very intense love. It's really interesting. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know if you've ever read Talk al Hanim. It's my, a fascinating book. My theory is that that's how he became bitter. It was a heartbreak. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's actually a good point. But he talks about it. Well, he doesn't get yeah. heart, he doesn't get dumped or anything. But he talks about his infatuation. He, he, that. Yeah, that is true. But I read, I read to about like years ago, so I, I like forgot. But he talks a lot of heartbreak, about a lot of heartbreak. Was that then? What was your other? <clears throat> the other question was when you mentioned the hadith of Khadija and. 
you, uh, you said you don't really believe in of color, and like you, Allah has, Allah has yeah, uh, color. you for yeah. that. Um, it got me thinking about how do you perceive Surat al Wulahab when they say Tabat al Tabat al Tabat of as a as a referring to an event that happened that Abu Lahab came to Muhammad and said Tabat yadak or something like that, you know, like curse your hands. Yeah. How do you kind of reconcile that? Do you view, do you view that as a as a true statement or true event that happened versus not viewing that? As yeah, a that I mean, uh, of course, it's not. Okay, Tabat Yadak was a much more common expression in, among Arabs in, in the pre Islamic Arabia than Qala or Qalaq. So it wouldn't, be, uh, it wouldn't be surprising that so when, when the Quran uses Tabat Yadak, that's not the remarkable because tabbat is a, was a very common expression but but that that's one but the other thing is you know um, it would not at all surprise me uh, if the exchange that that Abu Rahab said well when we know that Abu Dhab said a lot of derogatory and, and, and hurtful things to the Prophet, a lot of different things. Now, it, it wouldn't, the, after the fact, is it possible that the, the way it was remembered is that, the, is that Abu Dhab used the word tabet? while in fact what he said could have been very different i mean i don't exclude that possibility although i mean even the the way about uh, with the the i don't how to put this i don't put much weight on abu Lahab using the a precise word because actually, if he, even if Abu Lahab said that to the Prophet that's not that offensive. And I mean, he said far more hurtful things than that. And we, we have reports that you know, you know, you know, he called him a kazdab, he called, he, he called, uh, 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 accused him of being mentally defective, accused him of being insane, he, he called him majnoon, so, you know, did he use that imprecise word? No, but I have a, a problem was with reports that, where, for instance, it, 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 where it, we get into more serious grounds, where it will say something like, and then Abu Bakr said, such and such, and so the Quranic revelation came using these precise words, mm -hmm. and the, the the Quranic expression or the Quranic terminology is unusual for that context, okay. for that language. Then it it's problematic, okay. um, and especially when the when the when the hadith that tell us the narrative are always a mm -hmm. I mean they're. I don't I, I, I don't remember whether the, the hadith about Abu Lahab it is with a letter that Abu Lahab would insult the Prophet in all types of horrible ways, but whether he used that bet is with a letter or not, I, I don't I don't remember and I don't know. Um, but anyway, I mean it's I it's not a it's not a categorical point. It, it's a it's a point where you're analyzing material it's part of what you add to the the evidence in analyzing whether in fact this is uh, that hadith by Khad, uh, Khadija has a lot of other problems uh, um, including for instance that 
we don't have any context in which no one claims to have actually heard Khadija say it to the Prophet. <coughs> and the, pers the, the persons who narrated, it's not, it is such a small number of people, and it is not clear why the Prophet would tell them that while far companions were far more prominent and closer, um, didn't narrate it and doesn't, doesn't come through their talk. A, a lot of them, um, especially that, the, the, the narration of Khadisha, has missing links in the chain. And there's no explanation for these missing links. Or they have missing links in some versions. And then we find what is a generic name inserted instead of the missing link in different versions. The generic names, the go-to type of Ru'a, or the people that everyone would mention that no one was quite sure who they were, is always a problem when you look at this now. So there, there are a lot of things like that. If no one has questions, we could open to whining on the hedge. <laughs> No, you want to get to the wedding and the house. I know that. <laughs> no, give people a chance. <laughs> she, 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 she has her own. She's been like fuming about Hajj now. Right? It's, it's just a point of clarification. Um, if I understood you correctly, you said that in pre Islamic poetry, you do find the Arabs referencing nature prior to getting to the substance of an issue and um, and then you were talking about how that the, the, the Quran is also talking about the reference to nature and that that caught the attention of the Arabs is it that that the, the dynamics of treating nature is what caught their attention yeah the, the references to nature were, were not the way the Quran in terms of relating nature to the substance of what comes later. So as Arabs listen to the Quran by, by, the, by their eloquence in Arabic, they know, for instance, where it says, that, that there is a connection, it would say philosophical connection, between the night and day and the fact that your God comes to you and refrains from coming to you. And in fact, some of the, the, the very earliest commentaries on this say, you know, this is remarkable. This is exactly like the, even the state of one's Iman. At times you feel very close to Allah and at times you feel not close to Allah. It's as if at times you are in the day and sometimes at night. We find this in tafsirs like Tafsir Ibn Abbas, you know, the, some of the early, very early. So their musical ear understood that this reference to nature has a connection with the, what will come in the surah. That it wasn't just saying, uh, the way the Arab typical pre-Islamic poem would use nature is, it would say, um, there are a people, you know, there, uh, there are a people whose sun it shines, you know, and then we'll t say a few words about the, the power of the sun. And then, it, and you know that what it, it's a point of bragging. He, he wants to tell you that these people there and then he might connect it by you know by saying and they are so generous that when they cook I, they their fires that they light up to cook their meals are so extensive it's like the sun that's the way they would refer to the nature so that they're so generous that their you know their cooking pots become like a sun but the way that the quran refer to nature, it's closer, if you want a, a closer, it's a way that a Greek philosopher might look at nature, the way that the sophists might look at nature as a, uh, which later on became very influential in the development of natural law philosophy, 
I mean, it, 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 uh, building upon especially the Aristotelian tradition. It, the Mu'tazila, who, you know, not many of their tafsirs survived, but Zalakshar himself was a Mu'tazili, thought that, the, that they, often they referred to that as the proof that the Qur'an is Aristotelian, that the Qur'an when it itself was telling them when when the um, the the Ash'aris would you know or the Ahl Hadith especially would attack the Mu'tazila as Al Islamic, they say, How can you say Al Islamic when uh, when the Quran itself is Aristotelian? Because and what they meant by that is that it is nature based. It 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 tells us to reflect upon nature and that nature teaches us about creation and create and reflecting on that tells us what we need to know about the meaning of our lives and our relationship to Allah. And so, but long before the Mu'tazila, the, the musical ear of the Arab picked on these connections between the Qasab. Otherwise, when, when the Quran starts out, for example, by saying, Ha Meen, if you want it, if, it, if, it, if that didn't make sense musically to the Arab, they would have immediately said, this is like Ezra-like black magic, because they knew the use of, among the Ezra, the, it's not, it wasn't just Ezra -like, but in the Arab imagination, it was the, the, the Ezraites would give a number to, a, a numerical value to letters, and they knew that these letters were often used in the in what they called Solomonic black magic, the magic of jinn. There were some who made that type of accusation, but the majority of Arabs didn't say that that is positive proof that he's a magician. They thought, no, this is this is a music. That language is music that has meaning. And it's like I once heard, interestingly, was a professor at Princeton. Um, he said, it was actually Yudovich, which is odd enough. I mean, I'm being taped, so I shouldn't say it. But he you know. said, you know, when, uh, when Arabs come and tell me the Quran is eloquent or not eloquent, I don't believe them because the Arabs of today don't know, don't have the relationship to Arabic like the, the Arabs of Muhammad. So, of course, but he meant by that to say that, you know, Arabs of today are not qualified to talk about the, to say anything about the eloquence of the Quran. But uh, I, I took it, you know, he actually has a point because unless you know Arabic in a very different relationship, your statement about whether that Quran strikes you as eloquent or not is just impressionistic. You, you don't have anything to compare it with. Um, and it's it just a matter of you know, how it strikes your, your heart. Um, yeah, so... That, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's fascinating because this connection to nature, because you talked about you know, the significance of the Hajj and just going around in, in the circumambulation. And then even with our prayer, it changes throughout the year. So we know that there's a change in seasons because of that. Or when, That's Ramadan, such a really good point. Yeah. Or when Ramadan is, yeah. it's changing throughout the year. So there's always this cosmic connection from a very real and daily part well, of the you know, uh, you know that Muslims believe among the few that they they really wrote a great deal about and, and, and it's cosmology and and you know of course these the, these mahtutat today i was uh, <coughs> they're not published because of, you know the whole field and, but th there is no question that the quran sparked a deep interest it, between the, the relationship between meaning and the cosmos itself. And the style of the Quran is at the heart of that. I mean, the, the you know, it, I don't know of any other civilization that has written about 
until the the modern age, which which uses an experimental method and so on. <coughs> but if you exclude the modern age, Muslim civilization have written about nature more than any other civilization I am aware of. The, 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 the amount of manuscripts are you know, enormous, and and you, you know and. Anyway, and, and that has not, I mean, the, we, we have, how many scholars uh, who have actually paid attention to the whole issue of um, Muslim studies on nature? I mean, I, I, maybe, uh, what's his name, Saliba? Um, would he be one? I don't know, me too many. There was... Yeah, I, I actually don't know that many of them. I mean, I can, maybe Saliba would be one. Um, George Saliba. Wasn't he? He studied like, he did, like science. Yeah. History of science. And History of science and stuff like that. But to ask about a book that you may recommend regarding knowing the prophet from the vicar because I think these days the vicar of the prophet is like everywhere it's like sporadic like uh, with the apps like no like you know uh, that's a really good question you know <coughs> I can't I, I don't know any book in English that has tried to write because there's a uh -huh. translation from Ghazali. Oh, the uh, Fakasira? No. Um, oh, oh, you mean the, 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 the huh? Like oh, but yeah, okay. Um, is it the Remembrance book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, the, she, what Grace was referring to is Islamic Text Society translated um, Ghazali's. <coughs> Hamid Ghazali, the old Ghazali, his book on the, the Zikr of the Prophet. But you, you, the thing is that a lot of modern Muslims, when they read it, they, they, they can't, you know, they read, okay, the Prophet said X when he woke up. The Prophet said X when he would eat the Prophet. But no one present, presents a humanistic narrative. <coughs> and the closest thing that I know of is Muhammad al-Ghazali, not the old one, my teacher, wrote a book called Fiqh al-Sira, and I heard that it was translated to English. Um, yeah, it was. It was? You got me a copy. A oh, I did? A while ago, yeah. Oh, okay. Well. So... Is it different from Fiqh al-Sunnah? No. Oh, no, it is. It is. It is, yeah. No, it's called, uh, yeah, uh, Rami's referring to a different book of his, Fuqh uh, is Sira. Uh, uh, if I, I got a copy to read, so it was translated, read that. Here. Huh? I probably have it outside. Yeah. Um, then the other thing is, a few years ago, many years ago, not a few, but I did a, a, a seminar that I'm sh I know it's recorded, and I probably you guys have it posted, it's called um, A Humanistic Approach to the Life of the Prophet. Um, listen to these, it was it was very long. It was the, these are the Holocaust and the Prophet? Yeah. Yeah, we have them. Yeah, how many hours was it? <sighs> it was more than four. It's been a while since I've listened to it. Yeah. It's Maybe four to eight. Yeah, <laughs> I remember it was, it was uh, listen to these uh, halakos because I, I talk about the the Prophet as a human being and and that's the part that, that is completely especially uh, you know the, the uh, in the age of Islamophobia where um, you know the Islamic tradition because Muslims did not censor and cleanse the tradition. They, they, they were too honest. They pretty much gathered whether something came from an enemy or a friend. They, they preserved They preserved everything. They, they, 
unlike, for instance, a lot of the Christian tradition, a lot of the Jewish tradition, which is anything that was from the other perspective was lost, completely cleansed. So the, all the, the, the literature that, you know, we, we have to have the discoveries like Qumran and, and, and so on to, to get even a glimpse of what was the other perspective. But in the Islamic tradition, um, you, you find, because Muslims preserved everything, there are reports for that say the most outlandish things. And what the Islamophobes did is that they did for what we should have done. You know, we should have ourselves read through Bukhari and adopted a critical perspective towards Bukhari and critique the parts of Bukhari that should not be there. Not censored it, but critiqued it. So what the Islamophobes did, because we were lazy, they actually read through Bukhari, picked all the disgusting stuff, and put it together, and said, here's your prophet. And what helped them in this is the way we write our sira, which is basically prophet, Hijra, battle, 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 die. Which is fine, which was fine in an age where England is occupying your land, France is occupying your land, Holland is occupying your land, you know, Israel is occupying Palestine. So it, 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 it's, a, it's a way of writing Sira that encourages you to resist militarily. But the problem, though, is that if you're looking beyond the military, so beyond the act of resistance, it doesn't convince your kids. So, yeah, it, you know, it, I understand why modern Muslims wrote their seerah that way. And they, they went to Ibn Ishaq, or Sirat Ibn Hisham, and Ibn Ishaq, who has been is problematic at so many levels. And basically, they, they, they took it and, and, you know, but Ibn, the existence of someone like Ibn Ishaq was okay, or Ibn Hisham later on was okay, in light of you know, the writings of the Tirmizi and the Shema'il, because it, it, it all equaled each other out, and the, the, the Muslim shiuch before colonialism would not teach you just the battles, but would teach you the Shema'il, which are the qualities of the Prophet. And that is why, in, from every Islamic culture you go to, other than Wahhabi culture, you find enormous amount of poetry. You find all the Sufi chants, all the Sufi music about the love of the Prophet. Love, loving the Prophet. We love the Prophet. We love the Prophet. Everything that good that happens in the world happens because of the Prophet. Everything bad, bad that happens happens because uh, the Prophet, we don't love the Prophet. And love the Prophet and love his grandson. And this doesn't come from a vacuum. It wasn't that they loved the Prophet because the Prophet fought Badr and Ahud and Hanayn. And they loved the Prophet because of Shaman, because of the beauty of his character. And they, they understood him as an ideal person. So, for instance, I'll give you. I know this is well beyond what you asked, but it's just an opportunity to say something useful. You know, I got like a um, a message from some, I get these messages, I, I call them snotty kids, because I don't know if they're being snotty, or they, or they don't realize they're being snotty, or they realize they're being snotty, but you said that the private married the Maria Kuptiya, uh, uh, who's given to him as a, a slave girl. What's your evidence? Who are you to ask me what's your evidence? I mean, I've been a professor for 30 years and I have to 
provide evidence for what I say to and nobody is writing me out of nowhere. I mean, but, but anyway, that, that's... <laughs> I, I have another point about that. The point is this. One of my teachers, a long time ago, I... This is before I even came to the U.S., so I wasn't even I had not been exposed to Orientalist writings or whatever. So I was reading the stuff about Ghazawat and Sebi and so on, and I, and, and I, I had met some kid, um, one of these Salafi kids, who was, they, they were having a discussion in the mosque that if, when we defeat Israel and we liberate Palestine, do we enslave their women or not enslave their women? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm like sitting listening to this stupid debate, and of course, you know, the, 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 oh, the, 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 the companions of the prophet enslaved women, and I remember that the, the idea of the prophet forcing, coercing women to have sexual relations bothered me enormously. This, I had not been exposed to Orientalism or the West or anything. So I went to one of my teachers and it, it said, you know, I have a question about that. And I, I never forget his response. He said, you got to know the prophet personally through his moral character. You know what he says about insulting women, striking women, hurting women. You know what the, he says about the impermissibility of coercion. Can you imagine your prophet raping a woman? Because if you can, then there's no reason you should be a Muslim. I, it's, it shocked me. I felt so embarrassed to ask the question. That deep, intimate sense of who the prophet was. Mm -hmm. And once you pose the question, once I heard his answer, it's like, yeah. This, this man who's in a state of dhikr all the time, this man who, who said that if, if the, the tears of an orphan fall in the lap of God, this man who, say, who says that you, you can, who sees a donkey being exerted and comes to the donkey's aid, and you know, the, just end the stories that I talk about some of them in these halakhas, and then imagine him raping a woman and a woman screaming and yelling and, 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 and he squirting her. Either you can imagine it, then you shouldn't be a Muslim, because then it's unethical to follow such situation. Or you, you know who the prophet is and you can't imagine it. So it blows my mind. And it, it, when I see Muslims, you know, these snotty kids, well, I'm not the United the prophet, the, 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 it's like, you know, it, what, what the hell? Shut up, go get an education or get faith. Because as long, if you ask this question, you're not a Muslim. I mean, it's like parrots. They, they listen to Islamophobes and they parrot what Islamophobes say without a brain, without even the, the effort in some research that they could exert. And research not on the net, because I discovered from among students today that when you tell them, you know, shake your butt and get off your butt and go to the library, not the net. Because the net, any idiot can put anything on the net. And the text you read in the net are not authenticated, meaning that you know you can change all types of text and put whatever you want in them. It's it's you know, but whatever. I mean, I I don't. Uh, none of this had anything to do with your question. <laughs> but I don't have any beef in in seeing morons remain Muslim. You know, if you're a moron, good riddance. Alhamdulillah. You know. Go be whatever you want to be. Yeah, I think it's, it's also part of the greatest challenge that Muslims 
from my generation and subsequent generations are, are facing because we're raised and inundated with so much dogmatic fear that I think a lot of Muslims forget how they don't they don't even think they have the right to think for themselves that it's a matter of faith mm -hmm. then to just it's it's not about you know, ethics, it's you know, this is the prophet and we've essentially without actually we, we say we don't, but in reality we deify the prophet. We don't look at him as human. So if he were to rape, if he were to murder, if he were to pillage, it becomes, you know, if you have faith, that stuff isn't going to turn you away from being Muslim I mean, because I, in the end course, you don't I, want to burn in hell. And, 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 I, and I blame the Wahhabis for that because the Wahhabis, basically, the way they presented Islam is as if, oh, it's okay for your prophet to rape and you still have to be a Muslim. And we okay. saw the result was ISIS. But... I mean, because it's, it's, it's the thing is if you're saying well God knows best then you just you shut off your intellect and that's how that's how that dogmatism works is God knows best so if you're confronted with this kind of stuff just shut up put your head down and be Muslim because the hereafter is going to be better anyway so it's better just to I mean well, I you know of course yeah. There is a difference between, like, when, when I'm approached by, like, you know, once upon a time I used to teach undergraduates, right? And so you're approached by a lot of kids who are honestly confused, and they're respectful, and they're not snotty. You react very differently to them than, you know, kids that just, they, it's as if they're doing you a favor by remaining Muslim. And... And 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 I think that's a you know if you so I mean you're right because I, I it's not I don't want to sound too harsh um, especially that your gener I mean people of especially Muslims who grew up in the West have enormous challenges. I mean, I even add the challenges of um, this new phenomena of white Muslims who effectively, white converts, who effectively push that paradigm of m morality, the, the idea that morality is a Western morality and so it's okay if we don't adopt and so, for instance, you know, that you find white convert Muslims who say, so what, yeah, the Prophet had a slave, and uh, we have to accept that the Prophet owned a slave. And, yeah, when I think, like, okay, so a, a, a Muslim kid who grew up in the United States that hears what they think is a very respectable authority, a white convert, talk about that the prophet owned a slave and oh you know it didn't count as rape in their age because they, they, they get very confused but I go to my, the people I always blame can you guess who? Rich the, list, the list is long oh. <laughs> <laughs> but if they would have donated money to allow us to actually educate people properly, we wouldn't be in this mess. I mean, come on. I mean, they, they, you know, it's been a dream. When did I do that, the, the Holocaust, and the humanistic approach to the life of the prophet? I was, I was a kid, that was a long Very long time. Do you know it's been a dream that long that I just get the financial support to turn that into a book? Yeah. Mm. You know, just something as, as simple as that. Um, I blame Azhar too. Uh, yeah, we could, we, we could blame Azhar. <laughs> I'm okay with that. And weren't they gonna fund you at one point? They were. Yeah. They, they 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 were gonna get. Well, yeah, they were gonna get. They were gonna get behind me and all that. But anyway. So your comments sparked a lot of stuff. <laughs> What time is it? It's 9.20. Jonathan Brown's book just got published on the 
I know. I know. You think? I'll tell you. I'll tell, I'll tell you oh, when I'm like not on tape. <laughs> so we, we have seven minutes. Oh, that's the I have a question. Um, this is the one that I've been saving up for a while. But um, I just never had the opportunity to ask it. Is it a long one? No, it's a short question, but. <laughs> <laughs> we'll ask it and we'll see if we can we'll do see, it now. Yeah, or I mean, I, I'll be patient. It's been no, two we'll years. Ask I can... No, we'll ask it. Oh. Two no, years? No, I, I, it's nothing. No, no, I'm, I'm saying. Like, <laughs> yeah, you you just waited six years, years or eight I'm, years? I'm, I'm, Maybe more than two. <laughs> two years. It might be three or four. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really just about um, uh, using the uh, language of aesthetics to describe ethics. Like, you know, in your yeah, writings, like, beauty is, is good and. Uh, I mean, I know the Arabic works that way, but why have you uh, chosen to translate that in, in English? I'll give you the short version of the answer. Of my answer, virtue ethics. The, uh, if if you come to to um, Thousand Talks, mm. there are a couple of titles I uh, because I have the books in Thousand Talks. A couple of titles that I can that will answer that. Um, virtual, the, the beauty is not, simp it, it's not just an aesthetic term. It's a, it's a term that connotes a kind of virtue. A, and I believe when, when, because it's actually one of the reports, it's in the context of Surah Al-Duha, that, Allah, 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 that, that it, it occurs in the context or in the context of, of a reference to a type of virtue ethics. Um, So when the version of of this hadith on Atiya on Abi Sa'id on Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, قال إن الله جميل يحب الجمال ويحب أن يرى أثر نعمته على عبده ويبغض البؤس والتبؤس. So Allah is beautiful. Allah is beauty. Allah loves to see the signs of His blessings upon. People and Allah doesn't like the miserable and those who pretend to be miserable. It, it, this is typical reference to to the type of discourse that we that we use when we talk about virtue ethics, and so that that's a short answer to to that question, but. If, if, since inshallah you, you'll come to Taz Talks before you head back, I'll save the longer version till then, because virtual ethics is a, is a critical field today. This has and to be recorded. You can't just like, have it the audience of one. Oh, agree. You record everything, so you record it. <laughs> I'm sure you'll follow us. No, I know, but is this a really long explanation? Yeah, because it, it's... And actually, and there is one of the chapters of the conference of the books I write about that. And the book that I'm hoping to write now is entirely on that. Um, meaning that I've started it, but uh, what I mean by beauty, the, the, the thing that I'm working on now, pray that Allah helps me and I finish it. Sure. 
but it, it's when I use that word beauty, and of course I am drawing upon the the like um, uh, um, a sabahat al rawhaniya a book that it's a, it's a manuscript uh, by. You know, when you come over, when when you come to us, I'll show it to you. Uh, entire book about the relationship between al Jamal and Husn al and what and so it is. And Husn al is virtue. It's not the ethics of um, wrong and right, but it is beyond what is wrong and right. But what a virtuous human being would actually perform. And that is precisely what I mean by the word the beautiful or al hasan or al ihsan. It is not simply what you do to avoid being ugly or being a sinner or being wrong, but it is when you reach out to kamaliyah and you seek after perfection. It's like uh, among the the uh, um, Imam Jilani when he is asked to define the Jamal, well, it was in the context of Allah is beautiful, Allah is beauty, the, the ref, uh, commenting on that, and he said, "Al tatakhallak bi khulqillah." Now, so he, what he means by that is a sifat that you it, reach out to embody the divine characteristics. Now, obviously, he, 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 it, you're, he doesn't mean wrong and right here. And he, he doesn't mean becoming God. But is that you seek after, the, you, you, you are in a normative quest for the type of perfection that is God the type of virtue that is God. And that is a very pervasive theme. And a lot of people, do, so for, um, uh, a lot of people just think beauty is just simply an aesthetic term, and it, that's not true. It's, it's, it has a long tradition in virtue ethics. Do you, um, do you know, uh, Professor Jonathan Zaslav at the law school. He taught a course on law and virtue ethics. Um, course, he teaches it from a very Jewish perspective, but uh, it's very, very interesting. Uh, it's the type of course that maybe, inshallah, when you're a law professor, you should put together. I, I, I thought of plagiarizing it, but. I don't think it's very commercial to do that. Alhamdulillah. You've been waiting. Why didn't you ask that question earlier? I don't you just you know, since, the since, the, since the publisher of conference of the, uh, the books, that, you know, I keep. Well, I, I've heard that so many times. Oh, you know, isn't beauty just subjective? No, that's, that's, yeah, because what you, you have in mind about beauty is, is, is not is, it's not just an aesthetic thing. It's not a matter of taste. Well, anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay.